Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the Climate Adaptation Research for BC Agriculture Virtual Workshop. My name is Serena Black and I am the chair of BC ACARN or the BC Agricultural Climate Adaptation Research Network and currently work as the Agriculture Extension Specialist at the University of Northern BC. I'm joining in today from the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Kalaitle Tene uh, and acknowledge that uh, we have many people joining from throughout the province uh, and would urge you to think about the lands that you are uh, joining in from as well. This panel today brings together the experience of four, of four individuals with distinct sets of knowledge and experience with respect to wildfire recovery and resilience, both ecosystem resilience as well as social resilience and preparedness. For the first hour or so of our panel, I will be introducing and posing questions to our four panelists, and then we will reserve the final 20 to 30 minutes or so for the questions from the audience. So please feel free to utilize the chat box uh, to communicate with each other, but when you're posing a question specifically to one of our panelists, please do use the Q&A box uh, that you'll find on the bottom panel of, your, of the Zoom profile. Uh, and it's an easier way for us to make sure that we capture all of those and they don't get lost in the chat. Once you do see the questions popping into that Q&A box, uh, you'll see there's a little thumbs up signal. So you can use that to upvote questions that you feel are pertinent and that you would like us to ask. And it will help us prioritize which ones we can ask in which order. Uh, we have in the yesterday's session, we were able to get to most of the questions. So hopefully we'll be able to do that today as well. Uh, and yet, yeah, as uh, I mentioned earlier today, as we get started, a lot of you already have. If you want to uh, introduce yourselves and what brings you to our panel in the chat to get us started, that would be great. Try to get some virtual networking happening uh, in this world of Zoom and, and digital, digital networking, I suppose. So to get us started, I'm pleased to introduce Sonia Leverkus, who is the founder and ecosystem scientist at Shifting Mosaics Consulting. Sonia leads all aspects of Shifting Mosaic's project work and operations, and she is an ecosystem scientist with a PhD in natural resource ecology and management. Dr. Leverkus grew up on a cattle ranch in Southern Alberta and the Rocky Mountains of BC, where she experienced firsthand the powerful forces of fire. She is pa passionate about integrating science with traditional cultural and local knowledge to ensure thoughtful, applicable, and effective management of our natural resources. So to get us started, Sonia, um, I'm just gonna ask you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and the work that you are doing. Good morning, and thank you so much for that very kind uh, introduction. I'm uh, dialing in from sunny Fort Nelson, where it's a heat wave at about minus 10 today, and about three and a half feet of snow. Uh, I also own Northern Fireworks, which is a specialized fire company, and uh, we do prescribed fire, and we also do wildland firefighting, and um, I'm not sure, would you like for me to talk about developing prescribed fire burn plans and my work with that? I don't remember to unmute myself as well. So yeah, just thinking about um, maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about the context and the partners that you have worked with on describing on the prescribed burn plans. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. Um, I uh, work with uh, all the guide outfitters here in Northern British Columbia and ranchers, First Nations, Indigenous communities, uh, community forests, oil and gas companies, and uh, provincial government developing prescribed fire burn plans. Uh, mostly in the context of rangeland and habitat enhancement and conservation of biodiversity, uh, fuel reduction, community protection, and then during the wildfire season, I am an ignition specialist with BC Wildfire Service, and I'm really excited that one of our other panelists who is here today has had the opportunity to work a little bit with Mike, um, who's one of uh, our great mentors in prescribed fire in the province. Uh, I also teach and train others about prescribed fire and planning. And um, just would like to share that uh, primarily across British Columbia, prescribed fire was used uh, historically, traditionally, culturally by many different people. But uh, in today's world, unfortunately, it's very limited to a few small locations in our province. 
Yeah, thank you for that introduction. It kind of gives us a context of where you're coming from. With the work that you're doing right now, what areas are you working in most in BC? In which regions? Uh, mostly in the north. So uh, we have developed a prescribed fire program with the Burns Lake Community Forest. So that's uh, west of Prince George and then all throughout here uh, in Northeast British Columbia from Chetwin, uh, uh, Fort St. John, Dawson Creek and up here in Fort Nelson. But uh, we also are working with the territories and over throughout the prairies too. So we're focused on, on BC is where our heart is, but we're also across Canada too. Wow, that's that's pretty impressive. It's some some very big expanse of land of landscape that you're working with. Um, yeah, doing some travel for work myself, I I know how much how much time and area there is between the air spaces that you've just described. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today and and actually introducing us to our next panelist briefly. So next, I would like to introduce Mike Pritchard, and so Mike is a, a rancher and wild fire prevention specialist. Mike has worked, worked for BC Wildfire for 26 years and retired in 2019. In his youth, Mike was involved in the rodeo and then moved to Vanderhoof in 1987, where he set down his roots and started to ranch cattle. Mike has 50 Charlois, Charlois Angus mother cows. I am going to get in big trouble for mispronouncing that and all the work that I do with cattle and forage. I'm sure Mike will be able to help me out there. Uh, and Mike is the wildfire prevention coordinator for the BC Cattlemen's Association. So welcome, Mike. Um, I'll ask you to introduce, yeah, any additional introduction to yourself as well as uh, maybe an introduction to your project that you've been working on with the cattlemen. Well, first of all, we got to correct the uh, Charlet part on the, uh, the cattle piece. Yes. So. It's embarrassing. And then uh, another, just a little correction, as you missed 10 years, I was 36 years of BC wildfire. So, so my apologies. More than 10 years ago, right? So, yeah. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'm uh, actually calling today. And like Sonia, it's kind of nice and sunny here in Vanderhoof. It's not near as. Uh, as cold as is in Fort Nelson, but uh, not near as much snow. But uh, I'm calling from my other office because my other thing that I do is I'm the general manager of the, uh, or the uh, stockyard manager for BC Livestock in Vanderhoof. So Ryan, we just finished our, our fall run of cattle running through the yards here. So that got time to participate back in my other passion, which is the, uh, the wildfire and, and fire prevention piece for uh, BC cattlemen. So thank you for inviting me. So one of the big things that we're working on uh, with BC Cattlemen's and anybody who was on the call this morning uh, heard from Amanda Miller. So Amanda is one of the researchers that's been working on this targeted grazing piece that we've, we started back in, and she said the first project was, 19, was 2020. So right after 2019, we started on trying to get targeted grazing into some of these communities. And so that's been one of the, the big ones that we've done. She talked about three different areas or four different areas, Cranbrook, Peachland, and uh, Summerland, two projects in, in Cranbrook. And there's two others uh, outside of Southeast Kelowna in Kelowna that we're working on currently as well. And so the role of BC Cattlemen's in that is we provide uh, support financially for to bring these projects uh, to being. And most of it's involved with infrastructure and investment. So whether it's fencing, water development, uh, trying to work with communities, try to sort of smooth our way through. Because I know when Amanda talked about one of the questions that asked, well, do some communities like, or is it easier to get this target grazing into some communities rather than others? Absolutely. And so we have to work our way through to get community support for that. So that's, that's an ongoing piece that I, I'm involved with in, in doing that. Because we're of where we're at with the targeted grazing, we're right beside the houses. And, and Southeast Kelowna, one that we worked on this summer trying to get it up and operational is absolutely urban. It's uh, we are right beside Gallagher's Canyon golf course, multi-million dollar houses, and uh, we're right in the middle of it. We're and cattle will go out there in 2022. So in this spring, I think that's where that, that piece is going. So uh, the other sort of thing and I, I, one of my questions that you, I was presented was talking about another tool that we're using. We talked about infrastructure investment and, and, uh, and fencing is one of them. Uh, we are actually investigating through an in-house uh, 
sort of implementation of virtual fencing. So back in last year, we actually started working with companies in BC and Alberta on coming up with a virtual fence, which is basically collars for cattle that are electric collars with GPS components in them and trying to work our way through uh, the technology and the train and the topography that we have in BC. And that site that we have in Cranbrook is our test site for the virtual fence collars. So we are, um, three, four months into sort of having collars on cattle down in Cranbrook. And we are having some growing pains with the whole program because of, we all know anybody that does and is involved with cattle, they always think about how rough cattle are on things. Well, you wouldn't think a little collar would be beaten up quite as badly as it has been on cattle. And it's actually right to the, not just the components, it's the collar itself is, uh, is taking quite the beating. So that's kind of some of the, the things we learned that we weren't expecting to learn right off the top was we weren't building them tough enough for the, for the cattle. So that's where we're at. Um, the calls are off now for the, for the rest of the winter. And then we're gonna be looking at going back out and, and tweaking that collar system and getting, looking at different technology, making it more robust on, on some of the cattle that we've got them on there. But it's uh, the background for why did we go and look at this? We are looking at $20,000 per kilometer of fence in Southern BC. And that's generally where we've been working with the targeted grazing. So it doesn't take very long. And, you know, we have to have fences. We can't have the cattle in people's backyards because of exactly where we're at. We are right beside people's yards. So we have to invest in that infrastructure in some component. And at 20000 per kilometer, it uh, consumes budgets pretty quickly in order to do that. So this is just another tool along with electric fencing that we're, we're looking at and see if we can make it work. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thinking about how we are bringing in technologies um, to, to increase our management and to that, do that integrative management. And uh, indeed, how tough cattle can be on things. I think the last three years of pasture rejuvenation work I did was really building, figuring out how to build cages strong enough to keep those pushy, hungry cows out. Uh, to take those measurements. So definitely a feat there, but very exciting work about thinking how we can utilize an integrated approach for livestock and wildfire risk. So really happy that you're able to join us here today. And with that, I, it, it does relate to over to our next panelist, Lori Daniels, when we're thinking about managing for wildfire risk and, and getting more research done on that. So Dr. Lori Daniels is a professor at the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Daniels research strives to advance fundamental scientific knowledge on forest dynamics, which is imperative for conserving and managing temporary forests and adapting to global environmental change. Her research characterizes how natural disturbances, human and climate interact to drive temperate forest dynamics and resilience. Lori has established partnerships with local to national governments, environment, environmental organizations, forest management companies, community forests, and First Nations in order to translate these scientific advances to operational conservation, restoration, and management policies and practices. So welcome Lori to our panel discussion this morning. Um, and if you'd want to yeah, start by um, any, any other opening comments that you'd like to provide about you and your work, and maybe tell us a bit more about your applied research with respect to forestry management for wildfire risk reduction. Thank you, Serena. And um, I'm coming to you today. I just wanted to acknowledge I'm here um, in North Vancouver on the traditional territory of the Squamish uh, First Nation. And uh, normally I'm at UBC, traditional territory of the, the Musqueam First Nation. And I've had the pleasure of working throughout many, many regions in the interior of BC, collaborating um, with communities and First Nations communities, as well as municipalities and other organizations. And I wanna share some of those insights today. Um, I also wanna say hi to the, the other panelists, Sonia, who I get to collaborate with once in a while. It's so nice to see you. Mike, um, you know, your leadership with, with 
um, prevention and, and fire has been really inspirational, something I thought a lot about with uh, be working with BC Wildfire Service. And Wiley, I'm, um, it's a pleasure to, to be on the panel with you as well and to be learning more about the work that you're doing um, in the province also. Um, I'm based at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and my work really comes from a perspective of trying to understand how forests function. And so traditionally, my work um, for the last 20 years, 25 years at UBC has been around using tree rings to understand forest function. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've really transitioned a lot of our work to try to understand fire as an ecological process. And then, as you might imagine, since about 2015, but certainly since 2017, a major pivot in the work that we are doing to diversify our research on, on fire. So the historical work that we've done using tree ring science has been to reconstruct the role of fire as part of the ecosystems in the interior BC, not just in the valley bottom driest forest types, but across elevational gradients and um, into higher elevation forests as well. And much of what we've been able to reveal is that um, surface fires that create scars on trees and created that diversity, that patch um, patchwork landscape. If some of you heard Mike Flanagan speak earlier today, um, the role of surface fire in contributing to the diversity of our forests, intermixing with high severity crown fires at various places and at various um, points in time, really critical to the way that our ecosystems have functioned in the past. We have these fantastic fire histories that we've recreated for places in Southeast BC, um, on the traditional territory of the Tanaha Nation, in the Okanagan on the Silf um, First Nations territory, and then up into the Caribou with the Sequatmec. Um, our, our fire records often go back 350 or 400 years, showing surface fires burning once every 15 years or even less in the lower elevation sites you know, 20 to 40 years in the mid elevation sites. Our longest record comes from the Tobacco Plains um, in Southeast British Columbia. It's an 850 year record. It shows that fires used to burn once every five to seven years um, until the, the mid to late 1800s. So the research that we've done has shown a, a tremendous disruption to the historical fire regimes throughout much of the um, southern interior of BC. We see that the fire scar records really have an abrupt change that occurred in the first half of the 20th century. And we know now that that relates to colonization, um, European arrival on the landscape, the termination of um, indigenous fire stewardship across much of, of the traditional territories. We see landscape change as we began to have settlers arrive and shifts to agriculture and grazing, but also policies that wanted to exclude and, and protect communities from fire, a very Eurocentric view of fire being a negative impact and one that we needed to control. And then of course, industrial forestry. I teach in the forestry school. I'm well aware of the impacts of forestry on our landscapes um, and the way that we've reconfigured our forests often to make them much more susceptible to high severity fires so that we're seeing a shift in the way that fires work in our landscapes today. So much of our work kind of was grounded in understanding these histories. And then we began, began to realize through the, the shifts that we were seeing in those tree ring fire scar records, that cultural component emerged as such a dominant history in the province of BC, one that really supports the oral histories of First Nations people, which have been, I think, an eye opener, a real opportunity for Western science to engage with Indigenous knowledge, a major theme that we have been working on. But also related to wildfire risk reduction, one of the, the major messages that came out from our work as well is that as we've reduced those surface fires, virtually eliminated them because they are the easiest type of fire to detect and suppress, we've shifted the fire regime away from lower severity fires, taken away that component and allowed infilling of, of grasslands and woodlands by trees. 
Um, my colleague, Dr. Paul Hesburgh, who I collaborate with from the United States, describes us as having an epidemic of trees in our Western forests, um, where places, and we, we've seen this through aerial photography and the like, where we look at what BC looked like even in the 50s and 60s, our first rounds of aerial photography that covered the whole province. We used to have a lot more open grassland and woodlands that are now filled with fairly dense forests, and those contribute fuels towards the fires that we've seen recently. Kind of reverse engineering that then, combining the air photos and the, and the tree ring work, we can figure out where the forests have become more dense, where we've lost grasslands and open, um, open woodlands, and begin to rethink, you know, what, what would those landscapes look like if we reconfigured our, our forest management and our fire management? So that is much of the work that we do, comparing the resilience of, of those landscapes of the past to our contemporary landscapes that are burning at high severity. And then using that information as well towards fuels reduction, so mitigating the fuel hazards that have accumulated, particularly in the wildland urban interface, but across our landscapes in general. And so that work that we do is collaborative with communities, um, with First Nations communities, with municipalities, and a strong collaborator, fantastic organization we've had the opportunity to collaborate with is the Community Forest Association of British Columbia, who I understand also um, some of my collaborators tell me they are working with grazers and or with, with ranchers and looking at options of combining fuels mitigation with grazing um, and prescribed burning as we move forward. And maybe I'll leave it there unless you have other specific questions um, and, and come back to visit some of these themes as we move forward with our conversation. Yes, thank you, Lori. Uh, it's, it's really great to hear about the work that you were doing. And, and on a personal note, it really relates to a lot of the things I spend a lot of my time thinking with as a consulting agrologist. I actually work with Industrial Forestry Service. I'm the one agrologist amidst foresters being located in Prince George, thinking about both the management of forests, the management of agriculture, the interface, um, and what you've said about like all the shifts that we've seen, thinking about the historical shifts that we've seen uh, in the ecology. And now we're really at a, at a place where I think we all need to shift our perspectives on management and shift into how we're gonna look at integrating this moving forward. How can we, we make that change? And that's really what I see BC ACARN working to really heavily towards how do we get a diverse amount of perspectives. Uh, the geographic range of our panelists today across BC is really mm -hmm. encouraging and seeing uh, the, tr the transdisciplinary approach of, of let's work, break down the silos, let's make sure that we're working across disciplines. So really happy that you're, you and all of our panelists are, are here today. And talking about a transdisciplinary approach uh, we, we're talking a lot of natural science, sciences, but we can't forget about the social implications of wildfires uh, with, throughout this discussion. So with that, I'm really excited to be welcoming our fourth panelist today, Wiley Bystead, who's the Community Recovery Manager at Coyote Management. Wiley has a Bachelor of Communications from Royal Roads University and is an MBA candidate in Community Economic Development from Cape Breton University. Wiley works as a specialist in disaster recovery, contracting as the community recovery manager for both municipalities and First Nation communities across the province. She also provides additional business and community economic development services to nonprofit organizations, private businesses, and municipalities. Located in Alexandria, she has a small ranch and is an active participant in both local and provincial agriculture as a co contractor and as a volunteer. Welcome, Wiley. Thanks, Serena. So great to be here with everyone. And, and I have to say, as I'm looking out, I'm calling in from, from my ranch and I'm looking out the window, I think I might need some of Mike's colors for my sheep uh, because they seem to have found their way into my chicken coop. Uh, so never a dull moment. Um, and I am, uh, as I said, the, the ranch located in Alexandria, um, which is traditionally uh, the home of the Esdala people. So uh, I'm excited to be here and, and share the resources um, and the community um, with the Esdala people. Um, and um, 
so yeah, through through my company, Coyote Management, we provide a number of economic and, and recovery services. Over the past number of years, I've worked a lot as a community recovery manager, a specialist, um, with some forays into advanced planning and, and EOC support. And while our focus today is on wildfire recovery, I should mention that having worked in wildfires and floods and landslide disasters, the tools are the same for each. Um, and in fact, I was in Merritt on November 15th, working um, with the First Nations on wildfire recovery when the flooding started. Um, so our focus quickly shifted. Um, so yeah, it, uh, it's been an interesting year. A friend once told me that community recovery starts in a fog and, and ends in a mist. As you start the recovery process and begin to understand the event specifics and communities start connecting, the fog lifts and, and becomes more of a mist that gradually lightens um, the path forward, becomes clearer. The fog also kind of makes recovery hard to define. Um, there are broad commonalities because the work is similar. After any disaster, houses need to be cleaned, either from smoke damage or from mold from floods. But people are unique, and we can't forget to treat them that way. Um, people in communities come to recovery at, at different levels of readiness. Um, what one community can do in two months, um, another may take six months. So recovery and resilience um, is repairing and rebuilding lives and communities. And, and that means changes and transition. And, and I have to say in the best of times, individuals find change stressful. Um, in the worst of times, change can be overwhelming. Um, and so we, we find that within recovery, there are some real common features and, and in recovery, we call them the four pillars. So people, um, which includes the social, the mental health, the cultural well-being, um, the economy, the infrastructure, and environment. So in broad strokes, um, a recovery manager should always be collecting and documenting the pillar impacts. In conjunction with a wide variety of groups, they should be developing programs and activities and creating an incident-specific plan to guide activities while coordinating with all the other agencies and partners, um, which makes for a really interesting basket of activities. In real terms, this can mean that um, I'm on a quad, um, you know, riding over land to look at damage, um, you're flying over sites, you're spending time at people's kitchen tables, um, you're helping to complete individual applications for Red Cross or disaster financial assistance or other funding agencies, you're finding mental health calendars, you're delivering water samples, in addition to all the other usual hosting meetings and bringing agencies and people together. So good recovery happens when it's time for the recovery manager to go and the local community and residents have enough resources and support to continue on their own. And that's always the goal um, because recovery is time consuming and, and you can read papers that sort of say that, you know, for every, for every day of, of response or for every day of disaster, you know, you're looking at, at one to three months of recovery. Um, the reality is, is that recovery can take years, but recovery managers aren't with a community that long. So we really need to, to be good about getting sort of the foundation pieces in, in, in place so that residents and communities can, can work the plan and, and move on without us. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> it feels like a lot. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you for, for joining us and talking to us about what it looks like to manage uh, that change, manage those transitions. I, I do feel with, with the extreme events that we've seen this year, I know we talked about heat and drought yesterday. We're talking about wildfires today. I don't think anybody in the province could really be thinking about this without the, the atmospheric rivers and the, the flooding that we're, we're currently experiencing, as, as you mentioned at the top of your introduction. So 
really thinking about how we recover, how do we move forward, and maybe how do we build that resilience early on, I think is a key, key component to our discussions. So thank you for being here. So I'm, there's just so much that I really want to be diving into uh, and trying to make sure it's not all about what I want to, to hear from each of you guys. Um, I'm gonna circle actually back around to Sonia to think about that resilience piece. Think about this shift, it, the shifting perspectives that we have uh, and what we can do to help maybe mitigate the risk earlier on. So with your work and talking about prescri prescription burnings, I'd be really interested to start um, from your perspective and your experience. What is the greatest limitation that we have to prescribed fires in British Columbia right now? Yeah, thank you. What an exciting panel this is. <laughs> I'm really excited to be part of this. And there are so many uh, channels that we could go uh, along here. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk about prescribed fire. Uh, I'm more of a landscape fire absorbency person rather than resiliency. So I think about ways that the land can absorb fire. Um, I feel that that's a real positive way to think about it. And, and fire can be absorbed across the landscape by spacing out fire through time. So over the years, over the seasons, and also uh, spatially across the landscape. So when we talk about prescribed fire, and I, I there was a question in the um, uh, chat in the question and answer box there around liability, which I think is a, would be great to talk about, but it did make me think, I'd just like to make sure we all know what prescribed fire means in British Columbia. So prescribed fire is, the application of fire on the land through the use of a prescription, which outlines treatment, specific goals, management objectives, and the distribution of fire through space and time. And all of us who are prescribed fire practitioners in the province, we use the BC Wildfire Service template. Um, and in that, it's about a 14 page document. And uh, we outline the prescribed component. So just like when we go to the doctor and they give us a prescription, we're doing a prescription for the land. And so that prescribed component in a prescribed fire burn plan relates to the indices and the timing and the parameters. So what the weather and the fuel needs to be like in order to meet and, it, and achieve pre-established goals and objectives. So perhaps people might think prescribed fire is just a bunch of us, Mike, Mike Pritchard and myself and Lori and maybe Wiley tossing matches out. That's not what we do with prescribed fire. We're very professional um, folks when we apply fire to the land. And so I just wanted to make sure we're all coming at that prescribed fire component the same way. Um, I can very simply answer the question, what is the greatest limitation to prescribed fire in British Columbia? N not getting approved prescribed fire burn plan. <laughs> and, and I would uh, include a response, if that's okay, that the person that had asked the question was, they thought that the reason that there was less prescribed fires in BC was because of liability. But again, we don't just toss matches anymore. We don't just throw things out of airplanes anymore. We do our ignition operation uh, very planned out. And, and in that sense, that's like a contract. And so everybody who's signed on to that prescribed fire burn plan knows that these are the conditions, the weather conditions and the vegetation conditions that we're going to do that lighting of the fire. And so if I decided as, as an ignition person that, oh yeah, it's blowing 50 kilometers an hour today and we know we're gonna get more wind tomorrow and it's plus 30, this is a bit crazy, but I'm not going to light up in those conditions because those are outside of what we have prescribed, so to speak. And um, when people ask, because it's a constant question, asking about liability uh, around prescribed fires, well, well, we only light the prescribed fire in the indices that we've outlined all together. And then we have a containment plan and then we have a, a suppression plan. So I do not feel that liability, um, while many people point to that as the reason that there's no prescribed fire, my opinion and from my experiences over the last 16 years of prescribed fire, it's because of the lack of approved prescribed fire burn plan. 
So yeah, that's, I'm really happy that you, you jumped right in and also provided that framework of what prescribed burning is. Make sure we're, we're starting at the same base baseline. So you're saying that these, the lack of approved uh, of, of these approved plans moving forward, is that just like making sure I understand correctly, that's historically, we just, we haven't done it in so long. It's just not the norm it, or what are, what's holding up those, those approvals. I believe that uh, like we've had a lot of prescribed fire and, and anthropogenic or human fire. Um, Lori had spoken to it as well in the province. It seems in the last five or five to six years, I can speak to Northeast British Columbia where we've had maybe 50 prescribed fire burn plans that we've all submitted. <clears throat> There's only been not even a couple that have been approved over the last five to six years, which is astonishing because particularly in Northeast BC, the ranchers and First Nations and Indigenous communities, guide outfitters and packers, they all burn or use prescribed fire as part of their um, range tenures. And so just speaking to the legal component of that um, is, is in, uh, as a range tenure holder with the province uh, that's governed under FERPA, the Forest and Range Practices Act, so I, I double checked, uh, FERPA hasn't changed just yet. It might change soon um, in the next few months, but currently FERPA, Forest and Range Practices Act, still talks in part one, definition one, subsection D, I, that the application of prescribed fire to an area is considered as a range development, and that is tied to a range tenure and a range agreement. So range tenure holders, people that have the um, authorization to graze their animals on crown land, they have, as part of their range development by law in the Forest and Range Practices Act, the ability to apply fire to the land. So it does seem rather odd that all these prescribed fire burn plans that the range tenure holders have submitted are not being approved. And then I would also just say, you know, there's the Wildlife Act, uh, sorry, Wildfire Act and its associated regulation that also govern uh, prescribed fire or in, in those um, legislations it's called resource management open fires. And then just uh, one further point to that though is the traditional and cultural laws of First Nations and Indigenous communities in this province. Many of them speak to applying fire to the land for very many different reasons. And um, it has not been through the court system as of yet in Canada to prove that applying fire to the land is a treaty right or a traditional practice. But um, I say this from my work here uh, in Treaty 8 territory and on Casca lands that I think it needs to be discussed more so uh, in our Western legislation. And it's not just First Nations and Indigenous people who have applied fire to the land for a long time, it's also people who have been in, in these places like guide outfitters and ranchers and, and other people who have been in a place for a long time that have also been stewards of the land by applying fire. Yeah, it's, yeah, th there seems to be like a lot of different components, a lot of work, work going up to get those plans in place and a lot of pieces and pieces of the puzzle. Um, and we're seeing some of these questions come in are, are like, what are, what are the what would you say are the barriers to getting those plans approved if all those other pieces are there? That's the question. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I think I, so. Um, my response to that is there's ways there's ways that collaboratively um, that can work. Uh, something that drives me completely nuts, and probably some of the other panelists is you know we talk provincially. Oh yeah, yeah. We want fire on the land. We want to put fire out there. We want to support prescribed fire. Blah 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 talking the talk but when it comes to walk the walk and I submit prescribed fire burn plans through various different proponents that I work with uh, there's this reluctance in certain places in the province I, I'd like to highlight that the Burns Lake um, area has been awesome the, the um, Northwest Fire Center and the Medina zone and the um, district there have been incredibly supportive. We have a collaborative approach to prescribed fire burn planning. We're doing it right. It's amazing. But perhaps in other areas, there's a resistance and a reluctance by the managers or the, um, the statutory decision maker who perhaps view through a lens of trees and forests as a singularly 
as opposed to looking at this broad landscape, 19 plus million hectares in Northeast BC, where fire has moved throughout historically and traditionally, um, but um, there is a resistance to look at it through that lens, that holistic lens, the, the broader lens. So I think that um, we're starting to see the public challenging that, at least in the Northeast. Great. Well, thank you for expanding on that, Sonia. I think I, I definitely, I saw questions come in and I wanted to spend a little bit more time up front um, to kind of get that discussion started. And with that note, thinking about um, your experiences, I actually have the same question for you, Mike, as, as to what do you see um, anything to add to Sonia's um, response of what the really the, the greatest limitation to prescribed burning in BC would be? Well, having tried to get the fire on the landscape for many years, and, it, it, and Sonia talked about walking the walk, is uh, I think the, the approach that we took for years on the planning side was trust us, we're going to, this is what's good for the ecosystems, we're trying to build mosaics out on the landscape, all that kind of stuff. We failed. Um, and doing what I'm doing now and seeing sort of on the front end of trying to get this targeted grazing piece back into right where an urban environment, we have to get a social license up front. And so that piece if and where we failed, I think, is actually bringing communities on side and talking to them right up front and saying, this is why we're doing what we're doing and, and putting it out there and saying, uh, some of the really interesting stuff that we were doing in Cranbrook is that the prescriptions that were done down there for the targeted grazing piece included fire and cattle all the way from the beginning. And so that input uh, was put out to the to the folks that would be impacted by these, these projects down there. And so what they looked at was saying, okay, we're gonna come in and graze or burn after we've done a, uh, a uh, fire prevention project here, most of it's conifer over removal. And uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier, was that as soon as we do that, we actually increase the light, we increase the water, we get this flush of grass and brush. They took that as an opportunity to actually look at it and say, okay, let's look at doing putting prescribed burns in where we can do them down there. And then we maintain them for the next 10 years with cattle. And then we look at, do we want to do another prescribed burn? And the whole issue with that is taking that uh, sort of a snapshot in time and saying, this is how we want this force to look for community uh, protection, uh, fire prevention measures, everything like that. But the neat thing was they did it all up front. And that's where I'm seeing where we're getting the best buy-in is we're going down to the communities, taking the, the tough questions in these communities, but actually coming back with whether it's as much science as we can, as much sort of on the academic piece and saying, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And without doing it, the result is what you're seeing on the landscape in BC over the last 15 years, if we don't do anything. So that's how we... I see it as that that social license is important. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent point, Mike. And yeah, I'm you've you've already taken up a couple of my follow up questions. It's you're making my jobs. E I don't know if that's easier or hard, harder as a moderator, uh, but with the that work that you're doing um, and and having those early lessons from Cranbrook and seeing seeing that I think is really important, especially in this day day and age of trying to get those communications out um, and building that trust between people. So I really appreciate hearing your perspective there. And yes, so with that, it does actually lead, um, I, I wanna follow up with Lori now and thinking about the, the research that's been done. Mike talked about social, alliance, uh, social license, about how we, we need to start connecting it to the data that we do have. So. Lori, could you tell us, like, what have you learned, or is there anything in particular that you'd like to share uh, about the research that you have done with controlled burns specifically? Yeah, thank you. Um, we have had an opportunity to collaborate with Parks Canada, with BC Wildfire Service, with the Canadian Wildlife Service on prescribed burns being used primarily for um, ecological restoration, but also for some fuels mitigation work. 
So we've had opportunities to go in advance. With wildfires, it's very hard to kind of measure the direct impacts, you know, without getting plots in and instruments out in advance of a fire front coming at you. With prescribed burns, we have the opportunity to do that. And so we've made the effort, you know, to put in lots of plots and to um, have thermocouples buried in the ground and to be measuring temperatures and rates of spread and documenting the impacts um, of the fire directly on the ecosystems at the time of the fire and then have long-term monitoring plots where we can see how the ecosystem changes afterwards and we can make calculations about things like how much smoke was emitted how much carbon was consumed um, what were the impacts on the trees the shrubs the understory plants and then what how did they stimulate and grow back afterwards you know what plants came back what proportion were native versus non-native plants a whole suite of ecological questions and we certainly are able to demonstrate through that. So first of all, by doing controlled burns under the prescribed conditions that Sonia so clearly um, explained to us a few minutes ago, um, we, can, we can reduce the ecological impacts um, and keep them within the desired outcomes that we are looking for. So we can you know, consume some woody fuels, we can um, have impacts on small understory trees, thinning out some of those understory trees, but leaving the larger thick barked canopy trees um, to survive the fire. We can stimulate those understory grasses and native forbs that are adapted to fire. Um, the ones that Amanda Miller spoke about earlier today, you know, that are producing, storing carbon below ground, that are stimulated by fire, that are rejuvenated after fire. And we end up then with um, ecological benefits that kind of go across a whole range, a whole suite of attributes. We also, um, through prescribed burning, can mitigate fuels um, while emitting small amounts of smoke under controlled conditions. And I think if there's anything we have learned in British Columbia since 2017 is that the smoke impacts in the heat of the summer when we have wildfires that we are unable to control because the fire weather conditions and the conditions of the forest combined are creating fires that are exceeding our suppression capabilities and creating not only hazardous um, conditions for those who are in community in the way of those fires or being encroached upon by those fires, but all of us who are regionally breathing the smoke that are being generated by those fires, the health impacts um, in the short term and the long term are now being documented and we're having a better understanding of the consequence. Um, you know, so how do we want our smoke? Do we want it under controlled conditions in the shoulder seasons when we can use prescribed burns to diversify our forests and to reduce fuel loads and to stimulate these ecosystems where we can warn people who have health issues you know, to, to be prepared that smoke is coming for the next few days and here's how to prepare yourself, how to protect yourself from that smoke. Or are we going to continue um, to face the, the types of conditions that we have had in the heat of the summer of 2017, 2018, 2021? The smoke that we breathed you know, in 2019 and 2020 coming from places in Western United States where catastrophic fires were burning again, um, although we were a little bit reprieved for a couple of summers in BC. I, I think these are really critical questions and controlled prescribed burning um, are a really important part of the, the solution here in the long term. Yeah, thank you for sharing the all of those components. There's there's just so many pieces to this. And what really resonated with me is we we all experienced it. I the summer particularly, I, I had a friend who's a young mom who said, I'm literally in my house going to room to room, trying to figure out what's interesting because <laughs> it's not safe for me, me and the kids to be out, out, out in the garden, out in the yard. So, um, we, we really are feeling these impacts as a community. It shifted whether or not this person wanted to live in the interior anymore, like how it, it, it raises these big cultural components. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking about the, the role of controlled burns, how can we help mitigate that and, and do what we can in, in, in the shoulder season? So yeah, just really appreciate your comments. And Serena, maybe I'll just add too, in my experience, um, certainly over the last five, um, five or so years, 
um, there's a real shift, I think, and in, in the communities, I see the communities that are being impacted by fire kind of opening, you know, kind of the public within those communities, kind of opening to the suggestion of more diversified approaches. So as an example, um, in November of 2016, I was in Williams Lake, you know, presenting some of our research, talking about um, what were the solutions to the changes that we had seen in the fire regimes, in the landscape, in the density of the forests in the region around the community of Williams Lake? Um, the need for um, active ecological restoration and fuels mitigation and very susceptible forests. And when I mentioned prescribed burning, there was huge resistance, as you might imagine. Um, when I was back a year later in the fall of 2017, and of course we know Williams Lake was one of the communities so impacted by the 2017 fires with multiple ignitions within the community on July 7th um, with the lightning outbreak. Um, in the next two summers when I was back, you know, teaching and working and doing research, I had members of the community when they realized who we were from UBC, from the fire research group, asking when are you coming to do the prescribed burn in our community when will we proactively protect our our homes and community and so a real shift in thinking and we see that kind of localized and trying to expand that that improved understanding and um, um, appreciation of these really really novel ways to apply fire to the landscape Getting that across our province, I think, is really instrumental as we as we adapt and be better prepared and more sustainable. Yeah, those comments, uh, it really is about our lived experience. I know in our webinar earlier this morning, we heard that there, it, it might not be in our social memory to have these extreme events so quickly and having to live through it, how it shifts. Uh, I hosted a lot of the Williams Lake evacuees of family that year. Uh, and I, what your comments really resonate exactly with what they were talking about. Why, why weren't we burning? Why weren't we doing some of these things? So to really have lived through it really does change our perspectives and, and where we stand. And really all of it come, does tie back to Wiley and the work that, that she is doing with that recovery. So it's happened now, now how do we move forward? So Wiley, maybe to start, how is recovery different? I'm interested in this for, let's say, individuals versus communities. How do we approach that differently? It, it's not as different as, as, I, as I think we think. And, and, you know, the interesting thing with recovery that, that I, I keep coming back to um, is that we're on the ground with people for very extended periods of time you know, response, um, they come in and, and they're dealing with, you know, a, a week of fire or two weeks of fire. Um, we're there for, for months helping. Um, and so the relationship between um, recovery and, and individuals and communities is, is a little different. Um, and, excuse me, um, so, so there is some there is some really critical differences between how we recover with individuals and and communities, but um, but there's a, there's some similarities. So what I mean is that community recovery is is broad stroke, um, while individuals are fine print, is kind of the easiest way to describe it. Um, so for example, as part of recovery, there should be a variety of community meetings. Um, not just meetings where members can receive current updates, um, but potlucks where they can reestablish community bonds. Um, so part of community recovery is that community members need to see each other and ask, you made it, how are you? And if communities don't have those opportunities, then you see comments on Facebook. Where is this person? Why hasn't anyone told me X, Y, Z? Um, why isn't anyone doing anything? So they're not only asking for information, but they're looking to lessen the isolation by feeling like they're part of the group again, particularly with evacuees who may be in different, in different communities after they're used to being together. Um, and so I talked about the four pillars. And, and so again, community infrastructure, um, 
you know, inexplicably tied with, with the people because um, the infrastructure is, is part of placemaking. Um, and that helps to create sort of communal memories. Um, like at a grad reunion, um, where everyone remembers how hot the arena was on, on the night of grad. Um, and so it shows that there's sort of a connectedness in group memories. And so a community holds that. Um, and so community recovery is all about making sure that there's a physical connection and a physical community to go back to. Individual recovery is about making sure that the individuals are in a place to sort of rejoin, um, that individuals who need counseling are, are referred to, to the right kind of counseling, um, that their applications are filled out and, and sent in on time. Um, depending on what services are needed, and, and this goes back to the timeline, a recovery manager working with residents ends up finding everything. We find out about their health issues, you know, their financial history, their family life, everything. And I know it's an old fashioned term, but recovery managers need, need to be trustworthy. But more than that, residents need to feel that they can trust the recovery manager. We're asking them for private details in the hope and with no guarantee that we can help them. Um, so I've worked with, with DFA and, and residents on financial details. And if we're in a rural setting and they don't have fax and they don't have internet, how do you submit documentation? So they trust me to carry their application, two to three years of financial documents, you know, to town, send it for them and return their information to them intact. Um, and, and so, you know, and so there are differences between urban and rural response and, and recovery. And we have to, the reality is, is that there are some real differences in how we support residents in each of those um, situations. So, and communities and individuals access um, different levels of assistance, not just from funders, but from sector groups. Um, and, and so while I think I've been talking a lot about residents and businesses, and, and I will be, I don't wanna sort of minimize the impact and importance that community has, both as a physical location and as a concept to gather residents. Um, you know, people within municipalities, you always talk about the importance of a main street um, and what that brings to the community. And, and it's true, and it bears out in terms of how successful recovery can be. Um, you know, and I will say that, you know, I've worked with community groups on, on grant applications to restore local community halls. And I've worked with individuals and businesses on applications for new equipment. And it's almost the same activity, but the level of detail required for individual applications is always substantially more. Um, we tend to put individuals and residents and, and families um, through uh, politely through the ringer in terms of recovery, much more so than we do community groups. And again, that timeline of response, you know, it can take, communities can come together, uh, you know, much faster in terms of, of gathering and holding information. Um, it can take residents uh, much longer to be in a position to even understand what they're reading, much less filling it out. Um, and, and so the process becomes um, much different in terms of how we provide that support. Um, so yeah, few differences. It's just one or two. Thank you, Wiley. I, it's, Especially when, when we think about agriculture and our communities in agriculture, they have such, such strengths and such bonds with it, within their community and they're extremely resilient, but they are living in a rural landscape where we have to remember that they don't all have internet or reliable internet. Uh, so finding the strengths there uh, are really important. So I, I really, I've made a lot of notes and circling the word trust. <laughs> 
how important all of these pieces are. And now I did promise for our panelists that we would have um, the last 20 to 30 minutes to our uh, audience questions. Uh, and I actually haven't even gotten through halfway of my own question, prepared questions for each of you. So I'm going to stick with Wiley and answer an audience question before we cycle through and maybe mix and match between my questions and the audience questions as we come into the last half an hour of our discussion today. So Wiley, uh, the, we have a question here about how can we build more capacity for community recovery managers and recovery in general. The skills and experience that you have in community recovery are needed in so many communities and organizations around the province. So how can we help build that capacity? Yikes. Um, <laughs> Easy question for you. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, I'm, one of probably a handful of, of um, community recovery managers as, as a title, um, you know, in, in the province that do this, um, that do this as, as part of the regular work I do. Um, so the issue is that there's not enough of me, um, you know, or, or any of the other great, you know, recovery managers in the province and, and there's a handful you know of us that have been doing it for for you know pre-2017 um so yeah the issue is that there's not enough of us and we have more communities that need recovery than than we have um than we have than we have good recovery managers um so i think that there's I think that there's some things that, um, I have a background in economic development. So I look at things, I mean, that's my lens when I look at things. So um, I think that when I look at like local municipal economic activities, I think there are things that we can do to include recovery language and activities um, in everyday activities. Um, I think that you know, there's there's programs that we can use to, you know, building on Fire Smart, um, you know, building on the CRD's program of, of the Community Liaison Program. There are things that we can do to build capacity that are really great programs, um, but it takes somebody dedicated to look at recovery. When I look at, at programs, I look at things year round. So I'm not just looking at things when there's a disaster. And so, you know, as an example, we've been going through COVID, they've been rolling out programs. I've been looking at COVID programs and, to, and saying, which one of these are dual purpose? Which ones of these can we use not only for COVID, but for recovery purposes? Um, and so that's a lens that we need to train people and we've been really successful using that COVID example. We've been quite successful in, 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 in applying for grants, you know, for operations that have, have suffered under both COVID and, and, and disaster. So uh, there are ways, I don't have a really good answer for this question because it's just, it's just so broad. Where do you start? Uh, um, I, think that, I think that we need to make recovery language part of everyday language. Um, and I think that we need to um, actually encourage more people to enter recovery as um, a year round opportunity. You know, having, having because I work in multiple disasters, I'm, I'm fairly busy. Um, if you're only doing flood or if you're only doing wildfire, you may have a couple weeks or a couple months out of the year that doesn't give you enough experience um, or enough opportunities to build relationships um, because there's only there's always ever going to be a finite amount of recovery resources um, that the government or that funding agencies can provide. And so it's up to the recovery manager to really develop relationships and contacts and partnerships through the rest of the year 
you know, so that when your typical recovery isn't available, that you're always looking for other options. Where are the other partnerships um, to make things happen? That's not a really great answer, but it's what works for me. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, it, import, it's it's a difficult, uh, definitely a difficult question, which is probably why it got so many uh, votes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, I think having you join us today, starting this conversation, like you said, making it part of our language is an important step forward. Uh, whether we like it or not, I think recovery is going to have to become a recovery language is going to be going to impact all of us. We're already seeing, seeing it throughout our province. Uh, we're going to need to, to build all of our capacities to respond. And what I really resonated with is thinking about how can we shift this moving forward, making this year round, how can we start doing some of these preventative measures? And I do want to kind of circle back on hearing a little bit more actually from Mike's work, uh, the preventative work of thinking about how do we inter how do we shift and transition our, our focus on the landscape and thinking about different tools that we have to do so. So thinking about these virtual fency fences, these collars, Mike, I just wanted to make sure that we provided you with an opportunity of, is there, other than maybe making them a little bit more cow proof and robust, what were the big lessons that you've uh, had so far with your research project that you're able to share with us? Well, I think instead of just concentrating on our collar piece, I think we'd look at the whole targeted grazing, sort of that piece and, and looking at that in the future, because the collars are part of the tool to actually achieve what our, our objectives that were given to us by government was to in, investigate if we could reduce fire intensity uh, by cattle grazing cattle, or there was never a limitation just cattle. It was looking to, if we could graze and could limit intensities. And so I think we're on the right path for that. I think we've proven it. Uh, we haven't published the data for the yet this year, for the 2021 year. We've got one more year of funding for us to try and, and move into these Cologne areas. I've asked, I have some other ones. I have lots of interest by farmers, ranchers, municipalities, woodlot associations on how to make this go forward. So now what we're turning our eyes to is, is how do we implement this? How do we match up communities with ranchers to, to provide the cattle and, and to, to add that piece? We need the planners to do prescriptions up front and, and that whole, it's a, it's a broad based piece, but that whole implementation uh, piece was we move out the project or the, uh, the pilot project piece here. How do we get the funding to move forward? And it, it could be something with, it's, uh, it could be a fire smart piece of it. Uh, we could add in there, we could get more funding through UBCM. Uh, as these communities are the ones benefiting from it. Everybody always looks at it back and I'll put, put their, my rancher's hat on and says, well, they're gaining the grass for, for these cattle. Yes, but it, the cost is way, and the inconvenience of doing this way outstrips that any sort of benefit that's gained financially on that piece. So we have to, to look at that and work as, a, as the whole team in order to make this happen. So that's going right from the planners, right from communities and the community planners, because we are in an urban environment. We're no longer sort of out in the hinterland here with these cattle. We're, we're in an urban environment as we move forward. But it's so far, it's been really uh, uh, progressive from, from the communities that we are involved with. And like I said, we have some, you know, it's a, it's a tough sell in some places, but we're working with them and, and most, we're trying to work with our First Nations. We actually got a contract with them on one of the, the Southeast Kelowna ones is working with a, a, a First Nations ranch for West Bank First Nation there. And their cattle are going in there to work on mitigation on, on one of the pieces above, above a bunch of houses. So it's all, it's just, a, it's a lot of work to get, but as we know, and anybody's involved in it, it's prevention work, is funding. And we look at it and we've always done this, is we, we don't put enough money up front and we spend a, a lot of money on response and coming from my response background is and we talk about that in the in the wildfire side was uh, that dollar spent on wildfire we had a pretty good idea of what that was over the years but when we started bringing in evacuations to communities and we started having loss of infrastructure and and houses burning consistently year after year that loss 
over just totally dwarfs what wildfire expression is. And so that's the real cost to the province is all, and the people, and um, I think it's been really nice to see Wiley on, on the call here today because of that recovery piece is so, you, 10 years ago, you never heard about it. Now it, it's there all the time. And so that people cost, I think is the other one is that we're, we're looking at. So we have to invest in prevention in order to move forward. And that's what I see is, and move away from some of these other, because hopefully we're gonna get away from the response costs and the losses. Yeah, very just very pertinent comments, Mike. Thank you. It's it's almost if you've successfully prevented an extreme event, you don't have the data to show it one way or the other. So I I can kind of I definitely see that that vicious cycle and how it works through. And looking at the questions coming in, I'm doing my best to kind of mitigate both. Uh, but so we've talked a not enough. I, I've had so many more questions for, for both Lori and Sonia. So we've talked about some controlled burning, some prescribed burning. We've talked a little bit about potentially some preventative measures. But we have a question here as to what are other fire prevention methods um, that are being used, um, maybe besides what we've, we've touched on today. And this is an open question. I've seen Lori has unmuted herself. So I'll pass it over to Lori first. Thanks, Serena. I saw that question in the chat and kind of jotted down a couple of notes. So, um, so maybe what I would do is answer that this is kind of a shared responsibility across a whole range of, of um, scales. And so certainly when we talk about prescribed burning, we talk about doing that maybe at the community level in the forest surrounding communities and the wildland urban interface. And then also thinking about, you know, prescribed burns as one tool that could be used to mitigate fuels. Of course, um, Mechanical thinning, so actually going in and using silvicultural prescriptions or, or tree forest management um, as a tool. Um, but, but I want people to be aware that this isn't kind of your traditional forest management as you might see across the broader landscape. So we're not talking about creating clear cut patches, which are very common in British Columbia, but instead um, reducing the fuel loads of the smaller trees in the understory, the ladder fuels, those trees that have infilled in absence of the surface fires that have added the fuels and connect the fires that burn along the surface of the ground and connect, kind of create the steps where fire um, spreads from the surface fuels to those sub canopy trees to the intermediate size trees and up into the canopy trees doing harm. So when we do fuels mitigation, we're thinning from below, removing those sub canopy trees, removing the accumulated dead wood on the ground. Um, and then possibly coupling that with prescribed burns. And in fact, so many of our ecosystems in British Columbia are so altered today after a century of fire exclusion and fire suppression, it would be completely inappropriate to go in and do a prescribed burn in, in a forest without first mitigating some of that fuel. That's not true for all ecosystems. We need to be ecosystem specific, but certainly for many of our dry systems, um, dry forests, that would be the case. So, um, so there's multiple tools that we can be using, multiple ways that we can be or mitigating fuels um, in, in a, a patch of forest adjacent to a community. But I also think um, from a wildfire um, resilience perspective, we have to couple that with homeowners being fire smart, you know, making choices about making their own homes and yards resilient and creating defensible space around their homes when we work at the community level to address where are the, the hazardous fuels and then adding in our prescriptions, um, whether or not we include prescribed burn or if we use a fire surrogate to treat those fuels. And then scaling up to the landscape, we really do need to change the way we are thinking about both forest and fire management in order to create these landscapes more resilient. And that's again, we're linking back to organizations like BC ACARN is really critical. We cannot have this be just, you know, the forest, the forest sector and management of our forests kind of working independently. We need to be working with the ranchers and to be working kind of across those scales as we rethink those mosaics on the landscape. Um, where are we going to have grasslands and open forests and closed canopy forests? And how are we going to um, configure those and maintain healthy, resilient systems into the future? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's, I'm just feeling so energized. I'm kind of shocked that we only have 15 minutes left. Um, <laughs> uh, just 
yeah, just really appreciate all, all of your thoughts uh, and comments there. Civil pasture is something I know has been identified uh, in a lot of the different work that I've done at both at the University of Northern BC, but in the caribou, it's one of the research adaptation research priorities identified through the caribou agricultural research alliance. And so really kind of thinking of it as a whole systems is super pertinent. Um, before we move on, um, did any of our other panelists want to, to, to share their thoughts on on that question of, of other techniques or considerations that we should be thinking about um, for mitigating wildfires. One question that I'm not seeing anybody jumping at it, so I, I might sneak in uh, one of my questions here. Um, it, and, and this will be to Sonia is, um, why do you feel that prescribed burning is not currently being used in certain parts of BC? And what, what steps could we move, we, could we take to try to remove some of those barriers? I think that, um, well, I think we should have more incorporation at a higher level of prescribed fire, as in prescribed fire legislation in our province. It does, we only have very small components in our legislation that, um, that guides prescribed fire. That's just at a high level provincially. I think locally and uh, regionally, it's about collaborating and working together and uh, answering all of people's questions about why not, why fire is bad or why we shouldn't burn. We need to have those discussions. We also need to think about where we want fire and where we don't want fire, whether it's prescribed fire or wildfire. Um, we need to think about all of us being educated to the same level where we can talk about fire. Um, we can know a little bit about how fire moves across landscapes. Um, I think that a really great model to follow in the province would be much like the Invasive Species Council uh, of British Columbia has different invasive species committees throughout the different, I think, I don't remember, I think there's about 17 or 20 different invasive species committees. And I think just like those have been structured, we could have them as, I know that it's been attempted to have ecosystem restoration committees. Uh, but I think we could have prescribed fire committees throughout the province and at those committees there's land managers and decision makers, along with proponents and uh, various other folks who know about prescribed fire. And, and then we can answer those questions that we are continually being asked when we submit a prescribed fire burn plan and work through that together to develop regional strategies uh, around prescribed fire across the province. Yeah, thank you. I, I know I kind of threw you threw you on the spot there, but uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, looking at different models. I know there was a question in, in looking like, are there examples from elsewhere outside of BC that we could be looking at? So elsewhere, or even just uh, within different sectors, invasive species, how could we continue to develop these questions and moving forward? Um, so I'm gonna try to sneak in a few more audience questions here. Uh, and before I have, I'll do a special round robin lightning round uh, before we end the day. Um, but I'll, I'll go to the a question we have from John, which is, has the retreat of regular government boots on the ground from our rural communities contributed to the lack of trust in the various, I'm, I'm thinking there's, this could kind of impact, relate to a lot of the different things we've talked about today. Uh, but he continues as nobody representing our provincial or federal government is a trusted part of our communities. They have been replaced by a phone line, a web page, or an email address, has the drive to cut taxes, which has meant more cost-effective ways to deliver services, seriously damaged the trust needed between communities and government in order to work together. Serena, we have done some work, um, survey work with communities across the province about wildfire, proactive wildfire management. Um, and we've worked with, we've had responses from 140 communities across BC. And one of the key messages that came out of that was the importance of a community champion. That we needed to have somebody with that knowledge and experience in the communities, whether they were supported, you know, whether they were a government employee or um, came from other sectors. And, 
And so I would say, you know, the more we replace people, boots on the ground, um, and downsize local um, offices for various services, and I and I suspect this goes well beyond just you know the concept of prescribed fire and fire management. But the more we downsize and, and kind of go to those websites and other replacements for those services, uh, we lose those community champions. We, you, we lose the people who have the local knowledge and expertise, the trust within their communities, the liaisons who can really um, kind of show that leadership. And if we don't support, if we do not support our community champions, if we refuse to support developing um, local expertise, we won't be adapted for climate change. The importance of supporting our local communities, I don't think can be understated. Thank you. And Wiley, I see you've unmuted and then I'll pass it over to Mike after that. Um, yeah, and I think that, 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 that experience of boots on the ground um, is exactly sort of that role that the recovery manager plays because frequently we're in the community um, but I totally agree with Lori's comments on community champions, because from my experience, even when I go into a community, having somebody, you know, being able to find a neighbor that, you know, knows a lot of other neighbors um, is, a, is a benefit. Having somebody in the community to introduce you um, definitely helps to break down those barriers. And I think one of the successes of recovery managers is that we are in the community. We are that, that single point of contact that is going to answer the phone with a real person so that residents and communities feel supported. Um, and, and I, you know, in a, in a really simplified example, uh, I had a rancher who worked at a mill during the day, worked at his ranch when he got home. And the best, day, best time to talk to him was at 11 p.m. when he came in from, from finishing off his day. But knowing that he could call at 11 and get caught up and talk about his options when he was able to sit back and relax was huge for him in terms of being able to support him and, and move his family forward. Um, so absolutely being in the community, having that point of contact increases the level of trust. Um, you know, being able to, to help them and, and to say, and being honest with them, they may not like the message, it may not be what they wanna hear, but you still have to deliver the message. Um, and and having, you know, having that on the ground um, for recovery is, is absolutely huge. Yeah, there, there's a reason I, I hand out my cell phone number and also take 11 p.m. calls. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's deaf. And I, I've also had the experience of having to show up to community events multiple times a year for several years before really being given, welcomed in um, and built that trust. You, you, there's nothing that replaces those connections. Uh, Mike, I, I wanted to make sure we, we touched, reached back to you. Well, I agree with both Lori and Wiley, the whole boots on the ground they come from a long career in government that's the only way it, it you can actually make those connections with people is by actually talking to them so i i think that's part of it then it, it may be depending on but it, a lot of it's just a disconnect like we've moved to a whole different realm of communication we lost that personal contact so the person may still be there but the way of, of uh, gaining that communication is different it is is quite a different thing. Maybe it's more efficient, sure, but we've lost that person, that personal contact. So, and that's the only way, way you're going to gain trust is personal contact. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing replaces it. Uh, in short. So, Sonia, is there any any comments that you wanted to provide, or before we, I will have to move to some con concluding thoughts. <laughs> I, I did see a couple notes sort of asking about where people can go for more information. Um, maybe I'm not sure if you're gathering it, but um, we can all send in some websites for resources for people to learn more about anything that we've all talked about today. So that might be helpful. Yeah, thank you. And I, I was really optimistic that I'd get through all my questions and all the 
participant questions. And uh, as a surprise to no one who's ever worked with me, uh, I went over and talked too much. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think it's the, I first, I, I do wanna thank all of our uh, panelists here. Um, just keeping a note on, on the time, uh, we didn't get to all of the questions uh, that we've had asked today, uh, but perhaps if everybody's willing, I might, um, the one thing I, I would like to do a quick round robin on, one to two question, one to two sentence answers of, based on the work that you were doing, um, what are the immediate next steps or the immediate next research questions that we should be thinking about moving forward? Um, and maybe we'll do it in reverse order of introduction. So we'll start with Wiley. Awesome. What was the question again? <laughs> I thought I'd have more time. <laughs> no, I, uh, um, for, uh, with your experience and the work that you were doing in one to two sentences, what is the most immediate next step or next research question that we should be thinking about leaving the session with? Okay. Um, I think that, that from a recovery component, um, I think, and this goes back to one of our previous conversations, we need to be looking at how do we engage when uh, communities aren't in the middle of a disaster? Um, how do we engage with them to give them information on, on um, not only what they can be doing to keep their families safe, but what are those community activities that, that we need to be looking at in terms of resiliency um, and, and working with those community champions and, and commonality of, of language and activities. Um, I think we need to be looking at how can we bring that together. Thank you. Uh, so Lori, same question to you. I'm going... I'm going to follow up from what Wiley just said and said, you know, and say, you know, fire is not going away. We, we need to learn to coexist with it. Um, those proactive measures um, across all sorts of scales, all those different levels from home, homeowners to communities to landscapes um, are really critical. And so um, if there's anything I've learned in the last six months as we've survived a heat dome, extreme heat, catastrophic wildfire with huge human consequence um, that carried on through our summer, followed by extreme rain and the flooding that are integrated and inter integrally related. Um, we, we are living the effects of the climate emergency here in BC. Um, and yet we are also one of the jurisdictions on this planet that has a high standard of living and experts across these fields, um, many of whom are sitting on this panel with me today. Um, I have great hope for us in British Columbia, but the work is ahead of us. We have some big challenges, some big opportunities. Now is the time for us to think outside the box and to think with broad vision um, towards a, a better future for all of us and future generations. Fantastic, thank you, Lori. Um, and I'll, same question to Mike. So I'll go back to one of my other statements. It's, uh, it's all about whether it's the targeted grazing or any other prevention work, it's funding up front. And it's gotta be stable funding up front to make it to work out and move away from the reactionary funding. And so that's, that's the easiest way I see of, of making it getting more mileage or more bang for our buck is put up front. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Sonia, I'll leave you with the last words here. Uh, well, I have 11 uh, bullet points, but I'll just share in my last, my overarching bullet point, I think a research gap in our province is um, we need to determine how anthropogenic or human fire and grazing are part of properly functioning range conditions and desired plant communities. And I think that would help a lot of people in the agricultural and uh, range management industry to move forward with prescribed fire in particular. Yes, oh, thank you, Sonia. And I've seen a lot of uh, communication coming in through our chat. So the questions that we didn't get answered here today, um, we will pose them to our panelists. Uh, we will gather resources that have been shared uh, and additional resources. Um, and I might actually, um, maybe nudge each of our panelists because I didn't give you an, as much time as I wanted to, to really fully in, um, engage in that last question, additional thoughts that we will share with all of the participants moving forward. Um, 
And so first, uh, this I do. <laughs> Toastmasters has taught me ASL, so uh, American Sign Language. This is saying thank you to all of our panelists. I really appreciate having this discussion. Um, it's been an honor, uh, and I'm really grateful I've been able to meet everybody here. So as uh, we close, I want to acknowledge the generous support that has made uh, this panel and this, these workshops possible uh, annually. So our funding for this week's workshop has been in provided in part from an anonymous donor, as well as by the governments of Canada and British Columbia under the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, a federal provincial territorial initiative. Uh, I also want to make sure to invite everybody to join us for our, uh, our third day of virtual workshops tomorrow. Um, we'll have presenters and panelists to discuss carbon sequestration, potential to practice, a very important topic for all of us to engage in. The link has been shared um, so that in the chat so you can follow along and be sure to stay informed with uh, future BC ACARN events. Um, you can connect with us through our website, bcacarn.com. We also are newly very active on LinkedIn and in Twitter. Uh, it's really important for us uh, to continue this discussion. So thank you everybody. Uh, and again, thank you to our panelists. Uh, we'll be in touch. <laughs>